Let's uh, open up our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 6. Tonight we continue on uh, through our study in the book of Jeremiah, and we're going to cover chapter 6. I do anticipate that as we make our way through the book, we are going to pick up a little bit of speed. But since we've been a little bit actually in fits and starts here on Wednesday nights, um, because I've been out of town from time to time, uh, it is kind of good for us to keep it a little bit slow and just do a chapter at a time. So here we come this evening to Jeremiah chapter 6. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence in our time of worship. And now, Lord, uh, we fully anticipate that as we receive your word with faith, with the anticipation of your presence and your working in it, that you will indeed speak unto us. So we say speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The book of Jeremiah is all about this prophet Jeremiah over a period of some 40 years prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah and warning them, although by the end of the book, the warnings he announced had become fulfilled, but in the early portions of the book, he's warning them about the judgment to come unless they would repent. And really, that's been the theme of the first six chapters, which will complete this kind of first section. Chapter 7 begins a bit of a different section in the book. But let's read beginning now at verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 6. O oh, you children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a signal fire in Beth Hasarim, for disaster appears out of the north and great destruction. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. The shepherds with their flocks shall come to her. They shall pitch their tents against her all around. Each one shall pasture in his own place. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe to us, for the day goes away, for the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Arise and let us go by night." And let us destroy her palaces. Here, with the eye of the prophet, Jeremiah foresees the army of the Babylonians coming upon the beautiful capital city of the southern kingdom of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. That's why he says in verse 1, Gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. The idea was that the siege armies of Babylon were on the way, and once they surrounded the city, there was no getting out without great, great risk to life and limb. And so get out before the armies come. Set up, did you notice the thing? The signal fire is what he mentions in verse 1. You've seen this in movies, haven't you? where an ancient way of communications was to set up fires on hills, and one hill would see it to the next hill. And this was a very well-known method of communication used in this ancient world. And so they cried, set out the signal fires. The Babylonians are on the way. But look at what they'll do. Verse 2, he says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. Now we read that and we kind of go, oh, isn't that sweet? And there is a sweetness about it, but really in an ironic sense. Because Judah liked to think of herself as beautiful and refined, yet a lovely and a delicate woman may have wonderful um, abilities and uses in this world, but one thing she can't do is stand up against a violent man. And that's the idea he's emphasizing, the mismatch. There's the mighty army of the Babylonians marching against Jerusalem. And here's Jerusalem standing just as simply as if it were a lovely and delicate woman. The whole sense that Jeremiah is trying to convey is, you can't win. Don't think for a moment that you can successfully stand against the Babylonians. They're going to attack, and they're going to attack with fury. Look at the urgency reflected in verse 4. He says, woe to us, for the day goes away, for the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Time is running out. Jerusalem, you should have a sense of urgency to get things right with God because when the Babylonians come, they are going to have a sense of urgency in conquering over you. Now on to verse 6. For thus the Lord of hosts said, 
cut down the trees and build a mound against Jerusalem. This is the city to be punished. She is full of oppression in her midst. As a fountain wells up with water, so she wells up with her wickedness. Violence and plundering are heard in her. Before me continually are grief and wounds. Be instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from you, lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. Friends, there's something very significant to notice there in verse 6. Can I read that opening line to you again? It reads this, For thus the Lord of hosts has said, Cut down the trees and build a mound against Jerusalem. In the prophetic eye of Jeremiah, it is the Lord who is commanding the siege against Jerusalem. Now, isn't that a remarkable thing? Jeremiah wants everybody to know, yes, it's going to be Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies that come against them. We all know that. But make no mistake about it. They are not acting on their own. They are acting because God has given them the impulse to come and conquer over Jerusalem as a necessary judgment, as a necessary correction. They could not just blame it upon the Babylonians as if God had nothing to do with it. No, it was the Lord that said, build the siege around Jerusalem. Why? Look at there in verse 6. She is full of oppression in her midst. They didn't love each other. There, and sometimes we use this terminology, I hope you grab onto it. We, we use the terminology of horizontal relationships, you know, the relationships between person and person, and then the vertical relationship, the, the, in, the relationship between the individual and God. Listen, their horizontal relationships were terrible because their vertical relationship was terrible. And it showed, verse 6 said, because there was oppression in their midst. That's why he says there in verse 8, Be instructed, O Jerusalem. Now, this is very interesting. Why would God even say that? God wasn't saying to Jerusalem just, all right, you're going to get judged. Be fatalistic about it and whatever. No, be instructed, Jerusalem. I am telling you this because in every announcement of God's judgment, there is an inherent invitation for his people to repent. Be instructed, Jerusalem. Something can make it about this. You, you can become this land that's not desolate. But then verse 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts. They shall thoroughly glean as a vine the remnant of Israel. As a grape gatherer, put your hand back into the branches. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with he who is full of days, and their houses shall be turned over to others, fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land says the Lord. Friends, what a vivid picture is used in verse 9. Did you pick up on that? Look at verse 9 again. They shall thoroughly glean as a vine the remnant of Israel. Do you understand what it means to glean a vine? Well, let me put it this way. There was this practice in ancient Israel. Actually, it was showed one of the great uh, merciful things of the ancient law in Israel, that they told a farmer when he's picking grapes from his vineyard, don't pick all the grapes out of your vineyard. Don't go back and pick every last grape off the vine. Leave some behind for the poorest of the land to come through and to be what they called gleaners to go through the fields after the harvesters has gone through and to pick up little bits so that their own work, through their own initiative, they could have something to provide for their own needs. Now, friends, when the gleaners went through the vines, what do you think was left behind on the vine? Absolutely nothing. Picked clean. Can you picture in your mind a cluster of beautiful grapes? Wow, those look delicious. And then picture a little grape cluster completely gone of any kind of fruit. And you just see that bare, what do you even call that thing? Once the stem? I don't know. Once all the grapes are gone off of it. That's what Jerusalem would be. It would be, so to speak, picked bare by the Babylonian armies 
that we're going to come against it. And, and so there's urgency. Well, what should I do? Verse 10, uh, Jeremiah says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Just, just let me find one man who will listen to me, somebody who will get the message. I'm looking for somebody who might respond to this very message. But look at the sad note in verse 10. He says, Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised. Now, friends, we understand what, what circumcision is in the biblical picture and how God, with the covenant he gave to Abraham, commanded that all the males descended from Abraham be circumcised. But circumcision just wasn't something literal that was done to the male anatomy. It was also a picture of setting aside and of sanctification, of having, so to speak, I don't mean to speak in crude terms here, but to speak of the flesh being cut away, of somebody being set apart to God. And so that's why the Bible speaks not only of a, a, a literal circumcision that might happen to the males descended from Abraham, but it also speaks of circumcised and uncircumcised lips and circumcised and uncircumcised hearts set aside to God. What's interesting? This is the only place in the Old Testament that speaks about an uncircumcised ear. An ear that is so fleshly, is not open to God, is not obedient to God, that it cannot hear. Now what's interesting, and I, this just a little aside, there's one mention of it in the Old Testament, but the New Testament mentions the idea of having an uncircumcised ear in one place, and it was where Stephen spoke to the Sanhedrin. Acts chapter 7, verse 51, he mentions the idea of an uncircumcised ear. But, but anyway, if you want to get the point of it, the Hebrew repetition helps us out a bit here. Look at verse 10, the next phrase, where he says simply this, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. It's a reproach. They look at the word of the Lord and they, they despise it. As it says there in verse 10, they have no delight in it. Friends, what a way to measure the temperature of a people and of a community. How do they regard the word of the Lord? You know, have you ever read, perhaps you were there some years ago when we studied together on a Wednesday night, Psalm 119, and how the psalmist in Psalm 119, his heart, his mind, his entire being is, is just overflowing with love and appreciation for the Word of God. That, that, that's one that you can tell. You can tell something about a person's spiritual condition when they're in that place. But when a person regards God's word as something distasteful, they have no pleasure in it, they have no delight in it, it is a reproach to them, that is an entire other diagnosis of somebody's spiritual health, or maybe I should say spiritual sickness. And they had a low regard for the word of God. Friends, this was an indication that they were ripe for judgment. I hope I'm not overstepping the bounds of the text when I say this. When you find a people who consider the word of the Lord a reproach and have no delight in God's word, that is a people ripe for judgment. I can't say when it'll come. From the time Jeremiah wrote and prophesied this, it was still many years until the Babylonians would come. It could have been up to 40 years away. I would say somewhere between 20 and 40. We don't know exactly for sure when he gave this. But it would come, and it would come to a people who regarded the word of God as a reproach and took no delight in it. Now, that's one of the reasons why I like Wednesday nights. Can I just tell you, I don't think you people would be here if you um, figured that the word of God was a reproach and had no delight in it. Um, and so praise the Lord for that. It's a hopeful sign. It's a hopeful sign not only for your individual life, but for our congregational life, and could I say for our community, that there are people who do take a delight in the Word of God. Now look at the response. They consider the Word of God a reproach. They have no delight in it. Now look at verse 11. Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. You know, I look at this from a modern perspective, can I read that phrase again? Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. Don't you think for my, chill out, man. All they're doing is disrespecting the Bible. Big deal. God says, no. No. 
It's not just you have a failure to appreciate the Bible in the same way that someone else may have a failure to appreciate Shakespeare or Homer or something like that. No, no, no. We're not just talking about it from a literary perspective. What we're talking about this is that God's word is one way that he displays his very being to the world. Your problem with God's word isn't just because you don't like the ink on the page or something like that. There's something about God that you don't like, and there's something about God that you reject. And here it is, written over the span of humanity for those who reject God, and they do it persistently enough and stubbornly enough, eventually God will reject them. And there's the word. Therefore, I am full of the fury of Of the Lord, verse 12, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land. And as you saw in verses 11 and 12, it was going to be everybody. The children, the young men, the aged, the husband and the wife, even the fields would feel it. The judgment was coming and nobody was going to escape from it. On to verse 13. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not all ashamed. Nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Look at the assessment of God. Verse 13, everyone's given to covetousness. Everyone deals falsely. It's as if God looked at the culture of the kingdom of Judah and saw how thoroughly greedy and corrupt they all were. And even, or maybe I should say especially, it was true of the prophet and the priest. How disgraceful that was. And friends, let me say, when the ministry is corrupt, When the prophet and the priest, so to speak, among God's people, when they are corrupt, then it is exceedingly bad for the people. And this was God's measurement. Even they are given over to covetousness and violence and dealing falsely. They're corrupt, even to the point, look at it here in verse 14, and this is a striking phrase. I'm sure it caught your mind when I read it first. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly. You see, God not only condemned the more obvious sins of corruption and covetousness, it's like those ones we can see. I mean, maybe we're guilty of them, but I mean, we can see those. But here was the other sin that God commended in the midst of them, is that the sins of the prophets who used smooth words to comfort and calm the people when they should be alarmed and provoked to repentance. In other words, there is a time for alarm. There is a time for the emergency broadcast system to be, you know, uh, heralded out and say, whoa, there's a problem here. There's a crisis. We got to get ready for this. And imagine, friends, in those moments where alarm and the emergency broadcast system is so appropriate, imagine how inappropriate it is for those who say, no, man, everything's fine. Peace, peace. And the effect of it, notice that phrase in verse 14. They have healed the hurt of my people slightly. You know what that has the sense of? It has the sense of treating a severe wound in a very superficial way. Okay, you you know how it is when your child gets the slightest scratch on it, and what do you do? Oh, let mommy kiss it. You know, we'll pat it. Oh, did you get a boo-boo baby? And just like that. Well, okay, think of somebody with some terrible compound fracture, you know, to a bone or something like that. And the doctor says, oh, did you get a little boo-boo? Let me just kiss it and pat it there. You say, doc, what are you doing? Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Everything's going to be good. Yes. In other words, you're severely wounded. But the doctor, who's supposed to give you the straight diagnosis, he's not dealing with it properly. Instead, what does he say? Verse 14, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Friends, sometimes we need God to deal roughly with us. F.B. Meyer said this. In our dealings with God, let us ask that he will not spare us or give us anything less than the best. 
The process may be painful and protracted, but it will be sure. You know what I'm talking about. You know what F.B. Meyer is talking about there, don't you? You've prayed that prayer, haven't you? Now, it was a good prayer. Do not feel ashamed for praying this prayer. Do not feel embarrassed about it. But sometime along the way, you probably did or you should have prayed this prayer. Lord, whatever it takes, draw me close to you. Lord, whatever it takes, I want to be your man, your woman. Lord, whatever it makes, make me a fit vessel for you. Now, can you be offended if God took you serious on that prayer? And says, okay, my child, this is going to cut a little deeper than you first thought. But I am the great physician. I know how to handle that scalpel perfectly. And I know how to suture up the wounds just right. I will take care of you on this. And that's a good prayer to pray. Lord, don't say that unto me. Don't say peace, peace to me when there is no peace. Lord, don't uh, deal with my wounds lightly, but give them the treatment they deserve. Again, in contrast were the smooth words of the false prophets saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, friends, peace, peace, that's a wonderful message to bring and one that most people want to hear. And might I say that it's a good and appropriate message in its place. Uh, Listen, there's a time to preach peace, peace, but then there's a time to preach a genuine confrontation with what God is against. The problem with preaching peace, peace, is that sometimes it isn't true. Sometimes there is war and conflict that we must deal with whether we like it or not. Sometimes you want peace, but things around you are calling for war, spiritual war, and you better face up to it. I think it was the uh, Soviet, um, the Russian, Leon Trotsky, who said, and I, I may be wrong in the attribution of this, But the quote goes something like this. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And friends, that has a genuine spiritual application. You you may have said, man, I just want to check out on this whole spiritual war thing. Man, forget that. Peace, peace. And God says, no, there's going to be seasons in your life where you've got to act like a faithful soldier and not lay down your armor, but rather rise up to the fight that God gives you to fight. Most significantly, there are times when God's word to his very people is not peace. Sometimes God has a word for his people, and it's repent. Sometimes God has a word for his people, and it's prepare for judgment. And this is a serious thing. But the end effect of it was not good for Judah. Look at verse 15. They were not at all ashamed. Think about that. For all of Judah's many sins, they weren't ashamed over them. Now, you can't say that without reflecting a little bit on our culture from the present day to just 30, 40 years ago. Think about things in our culture 30 years ago, that people would have been deeply ashamed about that they have absolutely no shame whatsoever. I I mean, there was a time, I know this is going to sound strange to some of you young people, there was a time when it was bad for an actress's career to take off all her clothes in a film or a movie. There was a time when that would be bad for her career. No, really, I'm serious. That they thought that should be something to be ashamed of. That a proper person wouldn't do that. In our broader culture, didn't that seem a million years ago? And it's just strange how this happens with friends. We've got to be very careful then that we do not take our cues for what causes us shame from our culture, but that we take it from God's work within us. And I'll admit, it is a high challenge. I think I face it just as much as any of you do. But then it says again, and I'll just read it. They were not at all ashamed. G. Campbell Morgan had a very challenging quote at this very point. He considered the work of Jeremiah to be the work of a modern faithful preacher. He said this about the work of a modern faithful preacher. His business is to create a sense of shame in the souls of men 
so to place their corruption before them as to compel the hot blush to their faces. Now, I read that quote from G. McCamel Morgan, and I kind of don't know what to do with it. I, I don't know exactly what to say to an audience at, at Isla Vista to make them feel ashamed, to have, you know, a, a red flush go up in their faces. God needs to give us an ability, a, a, a unction from the Holy Spirit to be able to do this once again. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. You see, God gives guidance to his people, but they're rejecting it. First of all, there's the guidance of the right path, but they say, no, we don't want to go on that. Then there's the guidance of the watchman saying, well, be careful of this. No, we don't want to listen to that. Verse 16, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is. They were in a bad place, but there was wisdom available for Judah. And one place that they could find this wisdom was to look in the old paths. Look to your history. Look to your forefathers. Look at what God did through the law of Moses. Look at what he did in the days past. There is wisdom there. And if you'll obey it, look at the phrase in verse 16, then you will find rest for your souls. This is the rich reward for seeking and seeing and walking in these old paths. Friends, that's a reward that can't be matched by anything, to have rest for your souls. You can have all the fame in the world, but not have rest for your soul. You can have all the status. You can have all the the, the economic resources. You can have all the comforts of this world. You can have health. But if you don't have rest for your soul, what do you really have? He says, no, here is where you'll find it. But look at their reaction, verse 16. But they said, We will not walk in it. Despite God's instruction and invitation, Judah rejected the wisdom of the old paths. And even though, verse 17, even the watchmen called attention to them as if blowing the sound of the trumpet, what did they say? They said, we will not listen. Forget it, watchmen. So he says, no, they weren't going to listen to them. Therefore, look at what God's going to do in verse 18. Therefore, hear, you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words nor my law, but rejected it. For what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your offerings sweet to me. It's pretty dramatic in verse 19. God calls the attention of all the nations. Hey, whole earth, listen to me. I need to speak to you about my corrupt people in Judah. He says, verse 19, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words. Friends, this is a very important aspect of the guilt of God's people. And something that I think we all need to have impressed upon us. There is a sense, and I hope you'll follow me with this, because it's really just a sense. But there is a sense in which the sin of Judah was not their problem. Their real problem was not their sin, but that they would not listen to God about their sin. You, I, everybody in this world, we all have a sin problem, don't we? And the sin problem is taken care of by the beautiful provision and life-transforming work that Jesus gives to us through his work on the cross. That's a solution for the sin. Your sin is no problem for God, but the rejection of Jesus' work on your behalf? God says, well, if you reject it, I'll honor that. Do you see the distinction that's being drawn there? It's not the sin itself that's the problem. It's the closing of the ears when God says, come to me and repent. Come to me and confess your sin. That's the dangerous place. So he continues on. Verse 20. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Now notice this. 
They continued to bring burnt offerings and sacrifices to God, even very expensive frankincense from Sheba. Yet because they did not heed God's words or accept his law, the sacrifices were not acceptable. Friends, religious ceremonies, even sweet-smelling sacrifices that someone might pour out before the Lord, they cannot cover a basic rejection of God's words and God's ways. You really want to please God? Then all the religious ceremonies, man, that's entirely secondary. What you really need to do is listen to his word and listen to his ways. And if you don't, look at the result here in verse 21. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people and the fathers and the sons together shall fall on them. The neighbor and his friend shall perish. I'm going to deal with you directly. You're going down. And you know why you're going to go down? Because I'm going to put the stumbling block in front of you. It's not going to be fate. It's not going to be the Babylonians. It's not going to be a run of bad luck. God says, it's going to be me. I'm going to take you down because you were so persistent in not listening to me. And it's going to affect everybody. Verse 21, the fathers and the sons together shall fall on them. It'll be everybody. The neighbor and his friends, they all shall perish. Now in verse 22, it's as if Jeremiah... And friends, as I read verses 22 through 26, I want you to think of how it must have affected Jeremiah. You wonder, as if he receives this word from the Lord and he speaks it out, if there are not tears running down his face, if there's not a tremor, a fear, perhaps almost panic in his voice as he reads these words. Ready, verse 22? Thus says the Lord... Behold, a people comes from the north country, and a great nation will be raised from the farthest parts of the earth. They will lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no more mercy. Their voice roars like the sea, and they ride on horses. As men of war set in array against you, O daughter of Zion, we have heard report of it. Our hands grow feeble. Anguish has taken hold of us. Pain as of a woman in labor. Do not go out into the field nor walk by the way because of the sword of the enemy. Fear is on every side, O daughter of my people. Dress in sackcloth and roll about in ashes. Make mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the plunderer will suddenly come upon us. That's powerful. You can almost feel the sword of the Babylonian coming against Judah and Jerusalem in those very powerful words because the people come from the north north country and verse 23, they are cruel and they have no mercy. Verse 24 says they're going to bring anguish, pain. Verse 25, fear. And verse 26, mourning. The picture is almost like this. Remember when we saw earlier in the first couple verses how Jerusalem was like a very fair maiden up against a terrible army. Well, here, they're like a pregnant woman about to deliver up against a fearful army. Defenseless. They can't do anything. Now, starting at verse 27 to the end of the chapter, just these last four or five verses, there's a fascinating picture that the Lord uses through the prophet Jeremiah. And we'll conclude with this. Ready? Here we go, verse 27. I have set you as an assayer and a fortress among my people. By the way, let me stop right there with that word fortress. It's a little bit difficult in the translation there. The word fortress doesn't seem to make sense. There's some people think that some of the copyists might have made a mistake because it's very closely related to another word describing somebody who tests something. So, who knows? Anyway. I have set you as an assayer and a fortress among my people, that you may know and test their way. They are all stubborn rebels, walking as slanderers. They are bronze and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. The smelter refines in vain. For the wicked are not drawn off. People will call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. Now, look again at verse 27. 
I have set you as an assayer and a fortress among my people that you may know and test their way. God sent Jeremiah, the prophet, to be almost like a metal worker to assay or to, to, to judge the worth of the metal of Israel. Israel, you're like a hunk of metal. And Jeremiah the prophet is going to discern what kind of metal you are and if you can be refined. So Judah was like the metal claiming to be precious, such as gold or silver. And like a precious metal, Judah was tested and refined with fire. And then they put lead into it. Lead was used as a flux to draw the impurities to itself. And then the prophet Jeremiah was like the bellows himself used to create an intense heat and the fire. Yet Israel, the supposed precious metal, was so hard and so impure that the refining work was useless. Do you see that? Heat up the fire. We got to get this thing purified. The fire grows hotter. Use the bellows. Get the fire hotter and hotter. And the fire is as hot as it can go. Yet the analysis is this. There's nothing there worth keeping. It is useless. Cast it aside. A couple things we can consider in conclusion here. Do you have the picture in mind here, firmly? One. Remember that song that uh, we'd sing some years ago, Refiner's Fire? Now, you know, it's a fine song and all. Just sometimes I think that I, and I'll just speak for myself, I think I, I, I sang it kind of lightly. Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy. Well, friends, think about it, what it's like with that metal getting refined by the fire. It burns. And when the metal won't be refined, the fire gets hotter and hotter. The bellows works over time. Until the metal worker over it all is desperately looking for something of worth. And he'll put a little bit of lead into it because it was used sort of a thing to draw the impurities to itself so they could be scraped away and that what was left behind was pure. Now in Judah's case, the fire got as hot as it could. The metal worker worked as tough as he could. And at the end of it, there was nothing there to keep. Therefore, God says at the end, you saw that? For the wicked are not drawn off. People will call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. Now, friends, I need to be very straightforward with you. Somebody could take this verse in a wrong way and say that in some way God has permanently rejected Israel as people. That's nonsense. If God permanently rejected Judah at this point, why did he ever draw them back to the land with Ezra and Nehemiah? No, no, no. In regard to deliverance from this specific judgment, the Lord had rejected them. There's no way. It's going to come. For this particular judgment, at this particular point in Judah's history, yes, the judgment was certain. There was no escaping it. But nobody should read this for a moment and think that it announces or prophesies some kind of permanent rejection of God's covenant arrangement with Israel. No, that would never happen. But this is what I want you to understand. Thankfully, we serve God with a different covenant. I can imagine. Well, let me rephrase that. Do you understand that sometimes the most brilliant but wicked Bible teacher out there is the devil? And he knows how to use a text and beat you over the head with it. I can imagine a discouraged believer reading this text and saying, that's me. The fires of affliction have been burned up. I can feel the bellows burning over me. God's examining me, and there's nothing of worth there. God's going to throw me out. Friends, not so if you've trusted in Jesus Christ. Because there is something of worth there. There's something of surpassing worth in you. And trust in that. No, no, no. God may be refining you under the fire right now. It may be purifying, and it may be difficult. And I, I've heard this story, and I, I can't say I really know that it's true. It might just be one of those preacher stories, but sometimes those preacher stories are useful, even if they're not true. But in the ancient world, 
the way that an assayer, somebody who was working with the metal, the way he would know if it was purified. You see, the impurities would come up to the top a little bit with lead in there with dross, and they'd scrape them away, and they'd apply more heat, and the impurities would come up, and he'd scrape it away. And the way he would know that the metal was pure enough was when he could see his, his own reflection in the, the metal. Well, again, I don't know if that's true, but that's good, isn't it? it isn't that when God's refining work is serving his purpose in us, when his reflection can be adequately seen in us. Well, friends, that we need to look for. If you're feeling the heat of the refining fire in your life tonight, do not despair. A better refiner than Jeremiah is supervising your refining process. And he's sitting over it right now, and he's dealing with it, And he's not going to let the fire get any hotter than it needs to, but he will let it get as hot as it needs to get. And he'll keep scraping away the dross until he sees his reflection in you.